Sound okay? That's right. And uh, I think you're a pro prolific author, right? <laughs> I'm sure you'll, you'll tell us all about it. Um, so he's giving a talk titled tonight, Everything is Correlated. Um, and uh, I'll hand things off to you, Sean. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Sean Gallagher. And um, in addition to being a software engineer at Monotate, I'm also a uh, bit of an author on the side. Um, my first 10 years of my career, I was um, an editor at a couple of magazines and newspapers, and then transitioned into programming. Um, so I continued uh, writing after I started doing software development full time. And I'm the author of uh, two books. One is called Experimenting with Babies, <laughs> 50 Amazing Science Projects You Can Perform on Your Kid. Um, and the other book is called Correlated, Surprising Connections Between Seemingly Unrelated Things. And I have a couple of copies here in case anybody wants to pick one up after the talks. 
Um, so this is based on a website called correlated.org, uh, which I created about five years ago as sort of a side project while I was still uh, working at the Wilmington, Delaware News Journal. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how it all came about and then what has happened in the meantime. Um, so I was working as a web editor at uh, the News Journal. It's like the daily metro paper down in Delaware. And uh, working with a lot of public data sets. And as you know, you, you know, you're analyzing all of these figures, trying to see if there's anything kind of out of whack, something fishy. And it brought to the front of my mind something that I have always sort of had a fascination with, which is correlations between things that you wouldn't expect would have anything to do with one another. Um, I always enjoy you know, hearing about studies where those sorts of correlations are found. And I, I was just thinking about it and thinking, boy, it's, it's really hard to find those. And I guess it's almost by definition, because if, if, if it was intuitive, then it, it wouldn't be these seemingly unrelated things. Um, you would have a better idea of what you're looking for. And so that, that's why they, they turn up so rare abilities. Uh, nothing serious. You can see that the current uh, poll question is, pizza without crust is just fine or hardly pizza at all. Um, and people would answer these poll questions. And then at the end of the day, I would compare the results from that poll question to the results of every previous poll question I've ever asked. And I would find the two answers that have the strongest link. Um, any of you who are, uh, have a background in statistics probably understand that there are some problems with that approach. Um, uh, I, I wanted to mention also, you may have seen a similar website. It's called tylervigan.com. He does something a little bit different. Um, whereas I'm taking user-submitted user data and finding correlations, he's taking public data sets, mostly time series, and he's finding, um, he's finding things that have the same sort of trend lines. Um, now, uh, he came after me, and his book came after me. Um, <laughs> But very interesting stuff, nonetheless, to browse through. And I encourage you to check that out, too. Um, before I go any further, I wanted to mention that if we have time, um, I'd like to be able to all explore an anonymized version of the data set. And I have it set up as a very, very MySQL database with these four tables and these parameters. And I want you guys to start thinking about what kind of a query you would make against this. Um, if anyone at the end, I'll give them a copy of the book. Um, so just think about that. And a little bit about efficiency. You know, um, first of all, there's a sample population. And Uh, there's also
helpless friend. He says, "Flies cause But aside from maybe John, causation, other problems. Doesn't also link to this XKCD comic testing problem. They explain what's about when you do a poll, um, and you uh, that poll different. Uh, um, there's going to be kind of like an an average with the response. Maybe let's funny. Deviates in terms of answers. There's the quantify likely it is a particular. That's that I'm doing because um, easier to explain this. Um, right now I have more than 15 polls for about five years. Um, so when I take bonds, I'm comparing it against like 15. Odds that I'm not. I do 15. It's really uh, relations are going. Um, either that, that is the fact that this fact that you can't relations back from the fact.
a lot of Whether you're a parent predicts your pop culture preferences. And that's kind of intuitive, isn't it? Um, you you kind of figure that uh, non-parents are going to be more likely than parents to be, be big fans of you know, a pop singer. Um, anybody want to take a guess at what the potential confounding variable is, the thing that underlies it? Age, right, exactly. So uh, if you're a young person, you're less likely to be a parent and you're probably more likely to be into pop culture. Um, also affects your opinions about education. Um, parents uh, approve of single sex schools at a higher rate than non-parents. Uh, that might be another case where age factors into it and you get some teenagers answering the question and they'd rather not go to a single sex school. Um, whether you think marijuana should be legalized um, tends to be a good predictor of your political things. Um, thick, uh, conservative, liberal, liberal um, also of your beliefs about religion and morality. Um, Rastafarianism, uh, I guess, accepted, who uh, against the legalization of marijuana tend to be conservatives. Whether you're a good singer predicts whether you think you're good at a lot of other things. Um, and I, I do a lot of poll questions like this. Are you a good singer? Are you good at frisbee? You know, all sorts of random uh, categories. And the thing that I've noticed is whether you say you're good at one thing tends to predict whether you say you're good at something else. Uh, and the same thing on the flip side. If you say you're bad at one thing, you're probably more likely to say you're bad at something else. And finally, uh, the mayonnaise question. Do you like mayonnaise? have yet to find a correlation that is an inverse correlation with food, where a person says they like something but dislike something else. It's always the stronger correlation is, if I dislike this, I'm more likely to dislike any other food you mention. Um, so it, it does say something a little bit about your pickiness. Also says a little bit about your temperament. Uh, maybe this is a little controversial, but um, people who are picky about food, tend not to answer questions affirmatively when it comes to things like social activities. Um, I remember one poll question that I asked early on. Uh, the question was, uh, what do you think of old people? <laughs> old people are cute. Old people are smelly. And I figured that the people who say that old people are smelly are just people who have like a wacky sense of humor. But it turns out that they're just miserable people, and they're, you know, they, based on the responses I've seen, you know, they're, they're lonely, they hate kids, they hate anybody who's not like them, you know, it's just uh, pretty sad. Um, oh, okay. So uh, those are some life lessons, and now I'm going to hop into this is, this is a picture of my son licking my daughter's foot. Um, okay, so I'm going to hop into uh, this notebook, and I'll show you something that I had worked on before. Um, but again, I want, I want you guys to think a little bit about how you would query this data set. We've got four basic tables. We've got um, a list of polls, list of options for those polls, list of users by ID, and then a response table where you've got poll, option, user, and uh, like a date time. Um, so if anybody can come up with an interesting query, um, just uh, uh, I'll ask in a couple of minutes. Um, but let me show you one thing that I worked on is I was curious about what I'm calling uh, a person's um, contrarianness, uh, the level to which a person is a contrarian. And I define contrarian as answering in the minority position for a particular poll question. Um, 
And so what I did was uh, uh, wrote a script that goes through all of the users and looks at how they answered each poll question and whether they answered in the minority position. Um, I have a little plot here that shows the distribution of contrarianness. Um, what surprised me was that I've, I've cut this off at 0.45% and Point, uh, or you know, point 0.7 and point 0.45. What surprised me was how few people. Oh, sure. Okay. What surprised me was uh, how few people are outside of this boundary. I was expecting that we would have um, some people who were, you know, really, really deep contrarians who were just answering minority position questions just because they're that kind of person. Um, but in reality, uh, it does not appear that the data supports that hypothesis. Um, it looks like, on the whole, uh, people are answering these questions, um, I, I guess, authentically, rather than just being kind of like a troll and always saying you know, the unpopular view. Um, and so now I want to kind of open it up to you guys. And uh, if anybody has uh, a suggestion and you can't write it out, uh, uh, like and email it to me, you can just shout it out and we can work it out together. Um, let me pull this up again. All right, so yes. Sure. Yeah. So the question is, does the user see uh, what the current distribution of answers is when they're submitting their answer? Uh, it depends. Um, so in order to track people's answers over time, I need to be able to identify them over time. So uh, users do log in in order to submit their responses. Uh, but you also have the option to answer a poll anonymously. If you're logged in, you do see the current distribution. If you're not logged in as a registered user, you wouldn't see that information before you respond. And how that affects the data, I, I'm not sure. Yes? So for the anonymous um, uh, responses, then how can you associate one poll with another poll? Uh, well, the, the way I work it is I will register their response, and then I will encourage them to create an account if they create the account, then we'll be able to track them over time. If they don't, then we just have a single data point, uh, which, which isn't factored into the correlations, uh, but is factored into uh, the poll responses. Yes? What would be the most likely, most probable set of attributes for people who are always in the minority? People who are always in the minority? That's a good question. Uh, Okay, so the, the question is, what would be some of the most likely attributes for people who tend to be in the minority, tend to be kind of on this end of that distribution? Uh, I've never explored that, but we can give it a shot. Um, let's see how we might do that. Um, when I went through and uh, did this contrarian analysis, um, I put together a couple of extra tables here. Um, uh, so one of these tables shows the distribution of answers for each particular poll question. And that's how I was able to uncover the minority position and how many times a user fell into it. Um, I, uh, I will in just a sec, but I'm going to switch uh, tabs here. OK. So, oh, SQL Pro doesn't want to blow up. OK, I can't get that any uh, larger, but I'll uh, try to blow up the query when we get to that. So here's our user IDs, and here is their uh, level of uniqueness, their uh, level of answering the minority position. Um, I. Uh, very quickly, what we could do is take one of these users and see what their answers were for a number of poll questions. 
Um, so let's just take uh, one of these uh, folks that's on the lower end of the scale. We'll take user ID here. And let's see if I can, OK, I can at least blow that up. OK, so we're going to select from our response table where user ID is this. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to need to do a couple of joins so we can get some um, interesting information. So let's. Uh, Join our um, poll uh, and we'll do uh, the option that they selected. And what we're going to do is we'll, we'll take the poll text and the option text. Okay, let's see what I called it. Title. Okay, so let's see if we can. Uh, no, I can't blow this up. Oh, man. Okay, so. Which Canadian rock act do you dislike the most? Uh, Avril Lavigne. I think I remember that Nickelback was the other option. <laughs> um, and let me see if I can. Uh, uh, okay. Let's get. Um, let's join our option table one more time. Oh. Pardon me? Uh, yeah. uh, oh, well, I'm, I'm trying to pull in the table again. Um, but you're saying here. Well, I'd, I'd like to get both options for all of these polls so that we can see what option they selected and what option they didn't select. Um, and we'll have to get. Uh, all right, well, forget this. <laughs> um, here, let's go back to our previous query. All right. So uh, Avril Lavigne w and Nickelback, uh, would you like whipped cream on your Sunday? No. Oh, yes, yes. OK, so that's, uh, that's an interesting minority position. Um, which would you rather work five, eight-hour shifts a week? Or uh, I believe the, answer, the other answer was ten, uh, four 10-hour shifts. Um, which type of home maintenance are you more likely to do on your own plumbing work versus electrical work? Uh, have you ever projectile vomited? Yes, is the minority position. Um, would you rather blow up at someone you're mad at or keep it in? They'd rather blow up at them. And uh, do you ball up your socks to fold them? Yes. Uh, so I guess that gives you a few characteristics of this uh, minority position type of person. Uh, what can we glean from that? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I got a question for you. Do you know what's your least, um, what's your most like boss side poll? You know, I, when I choose the poll questions, I tend not to choose questions where I know in advance that we're going to have very limited responses in one direction. Uh, in fact, most of the, uh, the poll questions that people have suggested I put on the site, uh, I shoot them down for that reason. Um, 
for me, I, I prefer to get something that's somewhere in the range of uh, one third versus two third going closer to half. Um, but I do have a, a handful. Um, and uh, do I have time to just uh, query? OK. So we can query that and find out what the, um, OK. So we have percentages for all of these polls. And uh, let's see, unique percentage. OK, so we're going to select the poll ID from unique percentage. And we're going to order by the percentage. And we'll just, uh, we'll just join here um, our uh, poll title. What's your preferred search engine? And the answers were, let's see, uh, poll ID 123. People whose preferred search engine is Google and people whose preferred search engine is not Google. And uh, for poll ID 20, 123, oh, 123. OK, there you go. Um, it's hard to see, but the percentage is 96.72% say that the preferred search engine is Google. Uh, and uh, just over 3% say that the preferred search engine is something else. So, yeah? How do you recruit people for your poll using Google? No, no. Uh, no organic, no Google search terms or anything like that. Yes? Um, there, there's a, a lot of singletons, but once you get into people who have actually registered, there's a fair number of them who have answered practically every poll question. Um, I would say at least dozens, um, if, if not more. And then there's, there's a bunch, uh, I would say, in the hundreds who have answered more than 100 poll questions. Um, and uh, the other question, what, what can we say about those people? I would say that they're, they're the most complex people uh, because we have the most data points about those people. Um, I think it's a lot easier to, uh, to stereotype somebody who responds to 10 questions than to 1,000 uh, questions um, because there's, there's more nuance in those responses. In fact, there's been a couple of times when I've repeated the same poll question unintentionally and uh, people sometimes answer differently. Uh, over time. So, um, you know, there's, there's nuance to be found there. Yes? Where do you come up with those questions? Oh, it's so hard. That's why I switched from a daily poll question to a weekly. I've really exhausted all the low hanging fruit. Um, but if anybody has any interesting suggestions for poll questions, come find me afterwards. Um, I think that's my time. Um, so I want to thank all of you for your attention. And uh, like I mentioned, if anybody's interested in uh, correlated, which is very similar to the book in terms of its content. It's a nice coffee table book, uh, good conversation starter. Or if you know anybody who's expecting a baby, this is a great baby shower gift. Uh, just come find me afterwards. Thank you all.
Um, am I handing off this mic? Okay. sidecar and uh, I think let's get your mic set up real quick here Ryan and just make sure Sidecar. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the practices that we use in clustering at Sidecar, but more specifically just some of the, the best practices I think in general when it uh, relates to clustering. So I'll try not to uh, make this too much of like a, a sales pitch for our business, but focus more on uh, you know best practices when you're actually performing cluster analysis. Um, when I had talked to Mike a couple of meetups ago, he said you know there's a lot of people who are uh, more in the introductory level when it comes to uh, the, the people in this group. And so th there's a lot of these things that are, that are pretty um, you know, elementary when it comes to, fun, uh, to uh, clustering analysis. It's a lot of just sort of like you know, best practices, sim simple things to do. So uh, don't expect anything to be uh, like too in-depth or hopefully something that everybody can understand. So what I'm going to first talk you through is just quick introduction of me and, and the company that I represent. and then. Uh, the challenge that we're currently facing and how we use clustering to overcome that challenge. Um, so who's this guy? Uh, it's Ryan, like Mike, Mike already gave me the introduction so I won't spend too much time. Uh, <laughs> uh, 10 years uh, plus analytics experience between uh, a couple different companies and Sidecar for about four years now. Uh, I have a master's in predictive analytics and I am just, my thing got replaced or whatever, but it used to say one hell of a great guy. Also extremely humble, and that's my email address. Um, so who's Sidecar? If you guys aren't familiar with us, we are not the ride-sharing company. Thank God, because they just went under like three months ago. So um, that is not us. Uh, we're a local Philly company. We uh, specialize in the product listing ad space, but we also uh, dabble in Facebook and, and some of the other spaces out there. Uh, I'm not going to go through too much of this slide, but I'm really going to talk about here is, is our predictive structuring for uh, the Google Shopping space. Um, within Google Shopping, uh, it, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this nifty little diagram, I guess it's on your right, is a web page. Uh, there's the six little circles on the right which represent your, your ads. So when you search for something on Google, uh, you know, a product specifically or something like that, you'll generally see options from different retailers to, to purchase that product. Um, we work with the retailers and figure out how we uh, advertise, what's the best way to advertise to get your products into the, the proper positions in that, in that Google uh, search bar. So the difficulty that we have, oh sorry. Good off. Sure. I don't know that it's uh, on very loud. Is that better? Okay, I'll just try to talk louder. Um, so the, the challenge that, that we're facing and the reason that we employ cl clustering at Sidecar is um, we work with retailers that have thousands and thousands of products in their catalog, hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions. And representing each one of those as an individual ad unit within Google, uh, figuring out what the appropriate bid for each one should be, uh, has its own constraints for a couple different logistical reasons. One is that um, just the functionality of Google, the number of ads that they allow you to create within a, a, an individual advertising unit and, all, and uh, campaign, ad group, all those types of things that you don't really need to be familiar with. And then other that the, the data gets really sparse the further you, you spread it out. So, um, you know, we, we go through the process of grouping our products together so that we can advertise products that are similar with the same bid within Google. So the way, uh, maybe just to, to give a little bit more clarification for those who aren't familiar with the space, uh, it's an auction-based environment. So everything that's in the same ad unit receives the same bid, which is the amount that you're willing to pay for somebody to click on your ad. 
Um, so basically, uh, there are some traditional ways that people do it and generally are not that effective. And that's why they, they look for a, a clustering methodology or some other sort of some, some method. And, and we you know, do clustering. But um, the common approach that people take is there are like four canned categories out of, or four canned features that Google allows you to actually separate your product catalog on. So there's things like category, the brand, the condition of the product, is it new or is it, is it used? Um, and then you could, you could break out an individual item. There's uh, also a custom field that I'll, I'll get to later, and that's kind of how we, we go through uh, using our, our clustering algorithm. But you can see if you were just, just a kind of dummy data set, you could have a category or a brand that has products of vastly different price points that sell differently and, and all those kinds of things. So it doesn't really make sense to give those the same bid or say you're willing to pay the same amount uh, for each essentially view that, that this product is getting um, when you know the return you're gonna receive for that product. It could be, could vary drastically uh, across the group. So that's where the clustering comes in. Uh, so just, just a kind of like high level clustering in a nutshell cube. Um, it's just a process of grouping observations together that are similar. Um, there are many different clustering algorithms. So it's not just like, hey, I ran the clustering algorithm and now everything is grouped together. Uh, you know, there's, and I'll get into a few different options, but generally the, the the core principle of most of the things are to try to minimize the distance between observations that are in the same group and maximize the distance across multiple groups. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, it can be used across a lot of different in industries. Uh, most people use clustering you know, just to explore the, the this data set that they're working with. So a lot of times when you're just doing exploratory analysis, the first step you might take is, hey, let me run uh, you know, maybe like a basic k-mean, something simple, just to kind of get an understanding of, of the data that you're working with and the features in your model and how um, they're kind of related or what kind of structure that they represent. And then in the case that we're working with, um, we're actually trying to get more information out of, out of data with uh, out of observations with sparse data. Um, so for instance, uh, an example would be like, we, we get new products that come into our catalog. So a lot of the things that we use as far as like determining which products belong into the same advertising group together is historical performance data within the channel, within the site, all, all those kinds of things. But when a new product gets added to the catalog, um, Clearly, we don't have all that information, but we know, you know, it might share the same brand, it might share the same category, it might be the same color, same size as, as the uh, other stuff that we already have in our catalog. So we can kind of group it together by those similar features and say that, you know, we can extrapolate, uh, you know, this this set of products that shared a similar um, group of characteristics as this, this new product. Uh, it's likely going to perform similar to those. Uh, it's, I think a lot of people, or at least the, the people I know in this, in this uh, room, do a lot of work in like online marketing and things like that. And customer segmentation is, is a big uh, space for that. Uh, figuring out different like email advertising groups, uh, th things like that. I know there's uh, search engines that use clustering. There's this Yippee one, which obviously like less than 3% of the people actually use because everybody uses Google. but. Um, looking at the, the constructs of the search query that people have had and, and how um, other queries relate to that and the responses that, that, are, that, that come out. Uh, image segmentation, retail store, I'm not going to go through all of them, but, but you can imagine there's a lot of different ways that you can, you can leverage clustering. So back to, the, the, to our solution, uh, or just kind of a, a quick walkthrough of the example I gave before. So instead of just looking at a brand or a category, we might actually leverage, and this is just a very simple example, only looking at like four different metrics. So this is assuming we have some uh, historical data or, or stuff about the, uh, the characteristics of the product, but you could easily see that as we kind of like pick and choose things from each group that there's probably better groupings of products that you would want to advertise the same amount for within these original brand category breakdowns. So like if you just look at cluster one, for instance, these are all of our things that don't sell at all. So I'm not going to want to give these a, a high bid. Um, this is all kind of like anecdotal made up data, but you know, th this obviously has a much lower bid and we have a separate bid algorithm that I'm not going to talk about today. But then you might have other things that um, 
you know, have a high price point and they're, com they're driving a lot more orders, they're converting, they have a good, that CS metric is just a reverse R ROI, cost over sale. So th those things have, have a much higher bid. But if you're actually looking at various attributes, not just the, the physical characteristics of, of a product, but its performance history, which, which we have, um, then we can actually group products t together in, in, a, in a fashion where we're applying an, an appropriate bid to each advertising unit that we work with. So that's, that's enough kind of about Sidecar for now and, and how we utilize clustering. Let's just talk about some of the best practices within clustering. Um, so the first one is basically the best practice for any sort of analysis you ever do. Um, understand your problem. And I'm going to go through detail of each one. So just for now, I'll read them off. Uh, make sure you choose the appropriate method. Like I said before, there's tons of different methods that you can use for clustering. Make sure you're selecting the right features. Um, you're going to want to convert any categorical features into a numeric scale. So if you go back to the, the cube example that I had, where each feature represents like a dimension in space and you're plotting the distance between all your observations, how am I going to plot the difference between red and blue? Um, we can talk about that in a little bit. Uh, if, if you can or you know information about your, your features, and it's not just your first exploratory uh, kind of gaze at it, you might want to uh, weight the features and obviously you would normalize them before that. And then with any model, so basically the first one and the last one are really kind of what you should do with every uh, type of problem that you work with. You're going to want to evaluate your results and tune the model frequently. Um, so this is one of my favorite quotes. We'll get to my second favorite quote later. Um, but if you had an hour to, to, to spend to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes on the solution. So that's uh, Albert Einstein, and that's really um, the way you should approach uh, the majority uh, of the problems uh, that, that you face. Uh, if you don't understand what the question you're trying to answer is or, or what the ultimate solution would be, then you're bound to end up spending you know, that whole hour just fumbling around and not getting anything accomplished. And you'll end up going down many different rabbit holes and, and not actually getting to the, the point where you, you want to end up. So um, things that I recommend is to know your data sources. You know, where it, what's actual, actually feasible to do in your analysis, how quickly are you ingesting data, um, are there any nuances, inaccuracies, gaps. Um, understand the features that you're using. So there, there's, sometimes there's intuitiveness that goes into, into your model. So for instance, uh, you know, Sean was talking about all these different correlations. So you might have uh, metrics that are highly correlated um, and they, may just be random uh, randomness or it could actually make sense if you have a an understanding of kind of your data set you, you can you can really tell when uh, those things kind of make sense logically or not um, and then I think the most important thing and, and these are the, the things that, that I face in my day to day is understanding the the technical or the logistical limitations so you know anybody can build a great model or, or you know regardless of type if if they had all the data that they wanted or if they you know said I could I could build this super deep neural net or whatever, and it would take, you know, forever to process. But if we're, so for, you know, in, in our uh, example, you know, we have 100 clients or whatever with hundreds of thousands of products in their feed, running this stuff on every product in the catalog, I mean, that, that, that adds up. And, um, you know, that's why you guys are all here to, to kind of figure out those types of problems being, being data scientists and things like that. But, you know, at, at some point it becomes a roadblock. So you want to understand your, your technical limitations, make sure that you approach a, a problem in, in a way that you know you can get to a solution where people are going to, you know, be happy with, with, with what they have and answer the appropriate question. So the next step is to choose the appropriate method. So kind of depending on how your data is structured or, or what you're trying to do, you might want to choose a different uh, clustering approach. So like I was just mentioning, you know, some things could take a while to run, like uh, these spectral methods or hierarchical clustering where you're basically comparing the distance between one observation and every other observation in your data set. There are quicker uh, methods like uh, uh, clustering analysis uh, like for uh, k-means or um, you know, centroid-based things like Gaussian and, and k-means where you're basically just picking points in your, your space and comparing the distance of all the surrounding observations from that one point or from those however many points you, you, you select. So that kind of takes out the computational amount uh, of, of time that it takes to compute these things. So there's certain things where um, 
basi basically kind of the, the data that you have might indicate, or the, or the time that you have and the resources that you have might indicate the method that you're going to use. Um, you also, the structure of your data. So for instance, there's that picture of k-means versus spectral. So k-means is kind of, the, in, in that example, you would imagine that the, the centroid is like maybe somewhere, or two centroids, one on the right and one on the left. So all the blue stuff is on the left and is together, and all the red stuff is on the right and is together. But just looking at that, you know it probably makes more sense to have it grouped more of the, the spectral method way, which again goes back to sort of chaining stuff together based on how close each observation is to the observation next to it. So uh, I'm not going to go into like super detail on, on all the different methods and things like that, but just be aware that there are different ways that you could approach a clustering problem and that it's not always the, the same. I provided a, a link. Uh, I don't know if, if we'll make this available for you guys later. I can certainly do that. Um, to, to a resource that, that I find really good with uh, a lot of different details on, on clustering methods. Um, the second thing that, or I guess the third thing that I want to talk about is the feature selection. So there's a um, few different things that I, that I usually consider when I'm doing feature selection. So um, one is that there's probably stuff you can just toss right out the window from, from the gate. So if I had a, a full data set, like for instance, like product ID, what's that going to tell me? Um, it's it's going to be different for every product, unless there's some sort of way in the, the catalog that they do, you know, the same category as descending an ID or something. But let's just assume that, you know, there's really nothing informative about that measure, so I could probably throw it out the window. Um, you know, just, just having a Going back to knowing your data set, there's probably things that, that you know, if, if every single person in your catalog or every single product or every observation has the same value, that's not going to tell you anything uh, w about the uh, kind of makeup of, of the model or, or providing uh, like differential points between uh, multiple observations. Uh, the other thing is, is you should remove stuff that is, is redundant or highly correlated. So that's kind of like uh, similar to the same thing. It's not going to really give you any more information about your model. So um, you know, if I had two variables that were basically telling me that I could construct the same uh, ultimate like ending structure of my data, uh, I don't necessarily need to use both of those variables to do that. If everybody responded to that same variable, if all of my observations responded to that same variable in the same way, then I can you know, build a, a model and, and not confuse it by uh, adding in a bunch of redundant variables. Um, again, uh, we, we want to get to a final set that really minimizes that in-cluster dispersion. So that's like, if you go back to the cube example again, there's a bunch of little points in that cube. Everything that's in the same color, that should have a minimal distance between it. Things that are of different colors uh, the across cluster dispersion should be larger apart. So I might have a cluster of red things over here, and then hopefully another cluster way over here, and that there aren't things mislabeled uh, between the two. Um, there's some, some different uh, tools where you, or methods where you add and remove features, and you kind of see uh, how that affects the discriminatory power of things. So basically how it like, um, how, how you, how the final model looks like before and after removing a, um, a variable. So did it change the structure of it a lot when you um, added and removed things? And then principal components is probably like one of the most common things that, that people do, uh, just like a, a transformation of the, the eigenvectors so that everything is no longer correlated with each other. And it basically takes like uh, all of the features. So if you don't necessarily know things about your uh, feature selection, it, it kind of res preserves a, a component of, of each one and builds like a, its own sort of uh, projection of what's in there. But um, that's also harder to explain to, to people as far as like if you want to go to uh, your boss and say, hey, I built this clustering model off of like, you know, this variable, this variable, this variable, that's easy to say. But if I, I built it from, you know, principal component one, principal component two, sometimes that's harder to understand. But at the end of the day, if it's a better analysis and depending on the use and, and what you're trying to do with it, then you know, do, it, do what fits your needs. So again, that goes back to kind of knowing your problem space. Um, again, a, an, another link to, to some information about the way that, that people approach things. So this is like, I, I think my favorite part or my favorite thing to think about when I'm clustering. Um, I prob that probably makes me a huge nerd that I have a favorite part of clustering, but um, I like to uh, <laughs> I like to transform my category, or you have to transform your category variables into some sort of like ordinal or ordinal value. 
Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, how do you know the difference between blue and red? Uh, there's some like simple ways you can do that. <coughs> if you knew the information, like uh, if you knew the RGB values, you could easily just take those and, and use three features based on, on, on the values for those and, and, and use that. Um, I like to, to, again, tying it back to thinking about your problem, know my problem space and say, hey, uh, like for, I have an example here. Um, a, shoe, a shoe retailer might tell you that Nike is more like Adidas than it is to Rockport or whatever. Well, they know that somehow. And if you're working on your problem space, you should know something about it. And, and you're basically able to create um, a custom algorithm that defines uh, in, a, in an ordinal or n numerical way what your category represents or your, your or brand or whatever you know, the example is. So for instance, like what we do at Sidecar, um, we have brands, we have categories, we have colors, you know, we, we have these things that don't have that numerical value, but we, we know other things about them. Like we know uh, how often blue products are sold with green products. And, and, and you might actually know that like uh, maybe blue and green are really close together on the color scale. So you would say, hey, these things are, are like close together, but actually like blue and red are the most commonly as far as like their sales data goes and the behavior by like the types of products that they buy of those colors.